Hey y'all, and welcome back to Coding with Minmer. On today's agenda, we're going to tackle a hard leak code problem, 65 valid number. After that, we'll go over an actual variant of the original question that Meta asks. This variant pretty much replaces the OG problem, and for once, it's surprisingly simpler. Alright, let's read the problem statement. We're given a string of a number called S, and we want to return whether it is a valid number or not. That might sound simple, but if we read on, there's an influx of rules that dictate whether the number is valid. Uh, immediately, if that sounds like a lot of if statements to you, then you'd be 100% right. Rather than go down the list and try to memorize all the rules and exceptions in our heads, let's approach this in a more incremental and gradual way. Let's actually dive right into the implementation where we'll add lines of code with each new rule. I'm also doing this because clearly, I have no screen space. Okay, so we can think of this function as a public API. Our client can pass in a lot of invalid garbage strings, so we have to be very defensive in our code. If not, it might bite us in the butt later. However, let's think of happy thoughts first, that our users are well informed and use our API correctly. What happens if someone passes in a string of 420? Well, I love this. We'd intuitively loop left to right over each character and make sure it's a digit. If it's not, we can return false, but if we make it out of the loop, then we have a valid number we'd return true. Let's decipher this into code. Let's write that for loop, where with the pointer i, we'll parse every single character, and on each iteration, we'll make one check. That if the current character is not a digit, we can immediately return false, this is not a valid number. Otherwise, if we make it out of the for loop alive, we'll return true. So far, so good. And just so you know, for subsequent examples, I'm not going to write out the indices or the string quotations. Just imagine they're there, it'll make my life a lot simpler. There's another rule that our users can pass in decimal numbers. This means they can pass in something like this. As per the problem description, this is allowed and it's considered a valid number. That said, what if there were two dots and someone passed in this? This would be considered invalid because there can only be one dot. Makes sense to me, this would be considered false, an invalid number. Therefore, what we can do is track whether we've seen a dot yet with a boolean, perhaps called seen dot. That starts off as false. And we can use it to return false if we encounter a second dot in our number string. Here, in the first example, we only see one dot. Fantastic, we return true. But in the second example, when i gets to the first index, we see a dot. We'll set scene dot to true, which means on the next index, when we encounter another dot, well, that's not allowed. We've already seen a dot. We return false. Okay, so in code, let's create that Boolean variable, scene dot, that's initialized to false. We'll introduce an if statement to capture the case we have a dot character in our string. Now, if we do, we'll set that boolean to true. However, if we've already seen one up to this point, well, we can't have two, we'd return false. We have an invalid number. This is great, but hold on, our old code is giving us some problems. Take a look at this if statement. If we don't have a digit, we return false. That's now outdated and plain wrong because we can be given dots which are obviously not digits. What if a user passes in just a dot? Well, in short, we want to make sure we've seen at least one digit in our number string. Therefore, in the same way we track whether we've seen a dot or not, we also want to track whether we've seen a digit. And we'll set it to true if we do. So take this example right here. On the zero with index, we've seen a digit, thereby flipping this boolean to true. And then on the next iteration, where we have a dot, we'll also set the other boolean to true. And then we finish our for loop. And if we made it out of the for loop, we can check our seen digit boolean to see if we saw at least one digit. In this case, we totally did. We can return true. Otherwise, we'd return false, like this case where we have just a dot. We didn't see a digit at all. Let's translate this into code. Let's initialize our scene digit boolean and default it to false, just like scene dot. Next, let's invert this conditional on line seven and change the logic that if we did see a digit, we'll flip our new created variable to true. Lastly, after our for loop, if we never saw a single digit, then we'll return false. It's an invalid number. 
otherwise will return true. Up until this point, we haven't seen any signs yet, but we can be given positive and negative numbers. If we think about it, signs can only be in one place, right? The very first index of our string. Here are some valid examples, positive 3 and negative 10. As you can see, both signs are at the zeroth index and are followed by digits. Therefore, both are considered valid numbers. However, users who've skipped middle school may pass in something like this, or plus plus six. Let's defend against this. If we encounter either sign and we're not in the zeroth index, then we can immediately return false. Switching to the code, it only makes sense to add yet another if statement to check for these two possible signs. If we encounter either one, a minus, or a plus sign, and the sign is not at the zeroth index, well, that's invalid, we return false. And while we're here, we'll do one more thing. We'll actually flip the scene digit boolean to false. Why do we do this? Well, I hinted at it earlier, but we need at least one digit after a positive sign or a negative sign. Therefore, we need our scene digit variable flip to true once again after we've encountered a sign. Because imagine a user accidentally sending in just a positive sign. Well, on the zeroth index, we encounter a sign, it's at the right place, so we don't return false, but we'll set scene digit to false. I get it's already false, but I'm trying to prove a point here, because after that, we've looped through every single character, we haven't seen a single digit at all after the fact. And remember, this if statement here captures that case. Thankfully, because of that, we return false. Real quick, let's take this example right here. On the first iteration, we have a plus sign. That means we go into this branch where we set scene digit to false. And then on the next iteration, we have a three. So we set scene digit back to true, in which case when we finish our loop, then this line right here will return true. And indeed, it's a valid number. Now, another rule we must consider is that we can be given numbers with exponents. They can be in the form of a lowercase e, like so, or an uppercase e, both are considered correct. But sadly, our users might not be privy to math. They can technically send us something like this, two e's. It appears more than once, which makes our number invalid. Let's extend our code and add another boolean. What do we call it? You guessed it, it's scene exponent. Let's initialize it to false, just like the others. And then we'll add an if statement branch for it. And if we see a lowercase e or an uppercase e, then we know we're encountering an exponent. That said, if at this point we've already seen an exponent and we're seeing it for the second time, we return false. Otherwise, if it's the first time we've seen it, we can simply flip the boolean to true. This is very similar logic to scene dot. Here's something else users can throw at us. What if they sent just a single exponent? by itself. Well, clearly we need at least one digit before and one digit after the exponent for it to be a valid number, like so. As is, this is false. How can we check for these two error cases in our code? Well, luckily for us, we can easily capture these situations with our Boolean logic. That on line 23, if we encounter an exponent, but we haven't seen a digit yet, then we'll return the false. Now, if it's the first time we've seen an exponent, let's also set the scene digit to false, which again is our way of saying we need at least one digit after the exponent. Next up, we can formally apologize to our clients because they cannot have dots in exponents. That's a limitation as stated by the problem statement. So something like this, where you have a decimal in the exponent is not considered a valid number. At this point, it's pretty easy to extend our functionality we can change the logic that if we see a dot, but have already seen an exponent, then we can return false. Our clients can, however, have positive and negative exponents, meaning you can have signs after an exponent, so something like this. But wait, this now means there's not just one, but two places that we can have signs. The zeroth index, as established from before, but also right after our exponent. Let's modify the if statement branch that held the logic for signs. We'll add some more false cases that if the character before the sign is not an exponent of either case, 
then we return false. Taking a look at our example here, if I got to this point of this negative sign, we'd go into this if statement and note that indeed the exponent showed up right before our sign, therefore we do not return false. We will set scene digits at false, but don't worry, on the next iteration we'll turn it back to true, and when we're done with the loop, we'll note that this is a valid string. Amazing. Lastly, what if our clients are very misinformed and send us an A, B, C? Well, first off, thanks, that's not even a number, it's totally gibberish. We'd ideally like to return false. Looking at our chain of if statements here, we can simply add an else down here to return false. To say that if our current character is not a digit, a sign, a dot, or an exponent, it must be an invalid character such as a, b, or c. So let's do that. It's quite simple. We just return false to capture all the other possible characters. All right, and that's the whole implementation. Let's do one last example to put everything together. All right, say we're given an example string like so with the readied variables. We'll begin by looping left to right with a pointer i, where on the first iteration we have a digit, a zero. We'll go into this if statement here and verify that indeed zero is a digit. We'll flip the scene digit boolean to true. And that makes sense to me. We've seen a digit so far. We increment i to the next iteration, where we have yet another digit, we'll go through the same workflow and set true to true, so nothing really changes. Moving on to the next iteration, we do the same exact thing with eight. We overwrite the true with yet another true, but on the next iteration, we encounter a dot. Remember, we're allowed up to one for a decimal number. We'll go into line 17 here, where no, we haven't seen a dot or an exponent yet, so we won't return false but let's track that we've seen a dot. We'll flip that to true and we'll move on in our for loop. Now we have another two. Remember the protocol, we'll set scene digit to true again, nothing changes, and then go on to the next iteration. We have an exponent now. We'll go into line 23. Let's look at our invalid cases first. Have we seen an exponent already? No, this is the first time. And do we have at least one digit beforehand? Yes, we do. We can tell by this Boolean and looking at our original string, we have an influx of numbers here. Therefore, what we'll do is set both these booleans to their respective values. Scene exponent will be true because we just saw an E, and then scene digit will be flipped to false because we need at least one digit after an exponent. Let's move on. To index six, we have a plus sign. Let's go into line 11. Is the sign in a valid place? Well, it's not in the zeroth index, but it's okay because the character before is in uppercase E. So the sign is in the right place, we don't return false, so we'll move on and set the scene digit to false. It's already false, so nothing changes, but this is our way of saying we need at least one digit after a sign, and as you'll see on the next iteration, we do. We encounter a seven, where we'll set the scene digit back to true, and then we're done with the loop. We'll do one final check, did we see at least one digit, and in this case after the sign, Yes, we did indeed. Therefore, we'll return true. That is our answer. The time complexity is big O n, where n is the number of characters in our string. We got to process all of them. And the space complexity is big O 1, because no matter how long our string is, we only use three variables that's fixed. So we consider this constant space. All right, let's head into the variant. Variants like this are far and few between where Meta throws us a freebie. They essentially ask the same original leak code problem, but remove the concept of exponents. We still want to validate a number, but as you can see below, there is no mention of exponents. Therefore, we get to do something very fun that we sometimes get to do in our real jobs, press the delete button and demolish code. Let's dive into our implementation from before and nuke any logic that is related to exponents. All right, we can frame this variant as if a product manager comes stomping down in our direction and angrily asking us to remove the exponents feature. Out of utter fear, we immediately comply and scan our code top down. First off, we definitely don't want the scene exponents boolean anymore. Let's destroy that. Next up, when we encounter a sign, there's no need to check for exponents anymore. Let's delete that. After that, in the original code, remember we didn't want any dots in our exponents at all, but since there is no concept of exponents anymore, let's wipe this out as well. 
This entire block of code is related to exponents. Let's get rid of it. And that is it. The time complexity is big O n, just like before, and so is the space complexity to be constant space. Because of the fixed Boolean variables we use, which is now two, not three, but it doesn't matter. It boils down to constant space. Okay, good luck on your interviews. And if you learned something today, please make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. Thanks for watching.